Hello and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden, the last for this year. We are super thrilled as we're finally having an event live from Funnel. It's super nice. So, over to the agenda for today. First we do an intro by me. Uh, then we have proper state machine testing by Max Nordlund. Banking on closure by James. And then... Uh, we're soon Christmas, we'll have like the debugging carol, bugs past, present and future by Emil. And in the end, I will do a summary uh, and the schedule for the coming year. Yeah, there will be a new year next year, believe it or not. But first, I would like to say thanks to our venue sponsor, Funnel. And uh, with me from Funnel, I have uh, Ville. Welcome, Ville. And um, at Funnel, we care deeply about functional programming. And to put it in words suitable for a functional programming meetup, I will cite um, Eric Norman's great new book, Grokking Simplicity. We care about your data. We care about your calculations. But we leave your actions on your data up to you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and then we would also like to thank our video sponsor, <coughs> Other Beats. Other Beat is a small IT consulting company where most of the people actually have a background in functional programming. Um, yes. And if you want to support the meetup or the community, which you of course want to do, join the meetup group now. Follow the YouTube channel and check out the merchandise store and buy a cool t shirt with the logo on to spread functional programming. If you have questions during the presentation, please use the chat. I will read up all chat stuff. If you're in this room, please wave an arm and we'll give you a microphone so the people on the stream will also hear the questions. Um, yes, with that said, let's start. First presentation in widescreen. Or Welcome yeah, up yes. on stage, Max. Thank you. And your presentation. Now we'll do the magical switch of laptops. Let's see if it works. Here you go. Thank you. Hey. Okay. Oh. Can you see my presentation? I don't know. Uh, take crew. Are we are we good? Lovely. Uh, hi. My name is Max. Hello. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I work at Kira as a, a backend developer, and we mostly write in Erlang. We also use other programming languages, I promise. Uh, <laughs> and I'm in particular, I work with Kiva for Business, uh, and by that I mean Kiva for Business for receiving stuff, not for sending stuff. And we like state machines a lot in my team. So I'm going to talk about state machine both in general and more particularly how to test it in Erlang using a property testing library called proper. So the plan. What are state machines even? How can you use state machine as a design tool aka how to teach a product owner to think in state machines? An example, we're going to look at a user lifecycle. And by user, I mean like a user account on a, some sort of website or something. Every good presentation has a demo. It will probably fail, but it's still hilarious. And questions, of course. And finally, the most important, funny animations. 
Hell yeah. Okay, so what is a state machine? There are many different definitions. Uh, if you look at Wikipedia, you get into finite state machines and uh, automata. And it's very nice and it's very formal and it describes like the properties and how it's in the computational power compared to a Turing machine and stuff like that. And because it's limited, it's not a Turing machine. It means that we can prove stuff about it and which is why uh, mathematicians and programmers like them. Uh, I'm going to use this definition. There's a finite set of states and a finite set of transitions between them. This set of states and transitions is what makes up a state machine. You can also imagine it as a diagram. You have some boxes, you draw some lines, right? Those are transitions, those are states. Um, the idea is that by forcing you to look at your problem and your domain and write down it in terms of states and transitions, it means that you are, you can be very precise in what you mean. It means that the product owner and you are in much more in agreement of what, what is what, how something should work and so on and so forth. Uh, in fact, when we started like describing the, the keyword for business parts using state machines, our product owner at the time, he discovered a new state because he was thinking about an edge case and realized that that edge case wouldn't fit within the state machine that we had. Um, so we had to add a new state to the state machine. And it's really good. It really gives you a lot of precision and you can do that while drawing on a whiteboard without actually programming, right? You don't need to be a programmer to do a state machine. Yes. Um, stuff that you can describe with a state machine, the user. You can describe a cart ship, uh, or like a checkout flow. You can describe a truck. It has also states working, not working, maybe a few other. Um, there's a lot of stuff. State machines are awesome. I'm going to say something. Anything with a life cycle is a state machine. And that means that most stuff have a life cycle. And it's really obvious. Like if you have a customer, you have a customer journey. That's a life cycle. If you have accounts, if you have customers, everything. If it has a life cycle, it has states and transition. That's a state machine. And now you can formalize it. You can code against that. You can make contracts with that. You can, if you use a uh, static type language, you can even enforce that at compile time using clever uh, gymnastics, usually. Uh, I'm going to show how to do that using a dialyzer in Erlang, so you can do that in a more low key way. But uh, if you use Rust, you can have an enum for the different states, for example, stuff like that. It's very nice. Um, and as an example, as I said, we're going to talk about the user lifecycle. Show me some states. And funny animations. Anyway, so incomplete, pending confirmation, act, and grace period are the ones that I've chosen. These might not be the ones that you expected. Again, this is to prove a point that it might not be obvious. We all have different expectations. I'm going to talk about the user lifecycle, not necessarily what pages the user goes to in order to sign up, right? This is more abstract. This is what we want to model, like the domain. So the first one, incomplete, that's during sign up. We want to be able to create a new user, even though they haven't finished signing up, to be able to store their work as they're signing up. Uh, hopefully, you have like two fields, and you don't actually need this, because you want to sign up users really quickly. But if you need to fill in more, if you have it to do it over time, maybe you need to gather signatures. Uh, maybe you have to do that according to signature rules, firma technics regler. You know, you might be in this incomplete state for a while. So we have incomplete as the initial state. Pending, pending confirmation. That means converting their email. You know the classic. Uh, Please check your spam box as well. Click on the link. That sort of stuff, right? So first we incomplete, and by incomplete here, I mean like fields, like name. You have to fill in your name and stuff like that. You have to fill in your email. 
Then we wait for you to be confirmed. And once you're confirmed, you're active. Everything is hunky-dory, steady state. This is where we want to be. If a user wants to exit, right? They want, don't want this anymore. We need to be able to model, like either we do a hard exit, we did all this stuff, boom, shakalaka, everything's gone. Or we need to have some sort of grace period, right? Where we keep the data so that you can uh, retrieve it, so that you can um, uh, change your mind, you know. Maybe we need it for legal reasons. We will need to do a final invoice to make sure that you're not owe us money. That means that the grace period might be very long, depending on how long it takes for you to settle your debt with us. You know? So we have entered a grace period, and then at after, at some point in the future, time-based event here, ah, 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 ah. Uh, you, you, something has to change, right? In our case, I don't have model like the extra exiting. I haven't modeled the, a pure init state. If you want to be really like abstract, you can imagine all the users as a set, and then each user of, or like each user in the set have a state. And the first state is that the set of everything that's not your user, a non-user, right? So, in our uh, when we are modeling our states, they all start with no user or no, like the opposite, so that we can model everything in the same state machine, even the ones that does not exist in our system. But I don't do that here because that's kind of bonkish. Anyway. Have I have some transitions? Okay, this, okay, this is hilarious. Yeah, people on the internet, so the, the screen here is actually divided by six different TVs. And so my lines, those arrows that you're seeing, they are literally on the line in between the screens here. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> here we have some transitions, as you might kind of guess, I guess. Or if you're on the internet, you can actually see them. Again, as I said, this is kind of, you know, doesn't, no suppressors here. But we actually have some more state transitions that are valid. Because you can change your email, you can change your name, right? Which means that you can go back from being active to needing to confirm your email again if you change it to an email that, that's new. Or you go back, uh, if you change your, uh, your name and make it blank, that means you're incomplete. We have to go back all the way to incomplete. Of course, this might not be you know, super useful in the real world, maybe you don't, you know, accept not entering a name. But at least the active dependent confirmation, I think, is actually kind of the same. But I wanted some more arrows, because that's more fun. So here we have it. Some states, some transitions. Uh, if you go to a grace period, you can never get out, as you can see, right? You can't go from incomplete directly to active. That would be a violation of uh, our, our state machine contract there. You have to first be get your email confirmed by passing through pending confirmation. You can't imme you can't go from incomplete to grace period, etc. Make sense? Yes. Okay. So proper. Uh, it's an Erlang property testing library. Uh, I think someone else is going to talk a bit about generative testing as well later. Uh, proper contains two parts. I should also say you can find proper here. Um, there's a generative testing part, generate data, try it in your function, you write down some sort of invariant to make sure the data is correct. I'm going to talk about the other part of proper, which is about specifically testing state machines, where you model the state machine again, and then you can test the real implementation with, with a harness that like, takes it out for a walk and stress tests your your implementation and tries to find a set of commands, a set of transitions that should not be allowed, and then print that and see, dude, what the hell are you doing? Right? And the f what's great about using an actual property testing library than just fake using Faker, if you're familiar with that in different languages, is that a proper testing library also has something called shrinking, like quick check and proper, which means that it can actually reduce the, when, once it, when it finds like a counterexample, this set of commands or this set of data, it crashes your stuff, right? 
it can actually continuously run that again by but mutating this and trying to shrink it down so that you get a minimal example instead of having like this huge blob or whatever. But if you need a huge blob, because that's the problem, that's it's like bigger than one kilobyte, then you will get that. Yes. Now my favorite part. Demo! Uh, yes. So <laughs> yummy. Okay. Needs to be bigger, right? Maybe this big? Maybe we can do it like this. Maybe even bigger. Big enough? Hopefully. So I've written a user and I've written a user test tweet. In this case, I'm using CT to ask my like testing framework, you could like proper you can you can integrate properly in either EA unit or in CT tests. Since I'm running this big test, I'm doing it as a CT test, but you know. Um, generative testing, like the normal quick check stuff you usually do inside uh, EA unit. Uh, I'm gonna talk a bit how the has test harness works and how to how to actually write this as well, doing it a bit more practical. But let's start with the implementation first. Um, first off, I like types, even though I'm in a dynamically typed language. <laughs> As some of you know, he's laughing over here, by the way. Um, so I've defined, and like there's a Coutine uh, uh, convention, thank you. Uh, to call the name of this module's type as t, because this one will become then user colon t, like that. So when you refer to, to it outside, it looks a bit more nice. Uh, this is, uh, it's both a part of proper, it's part of elix elixir. Um, I'm using a generic type that's uh, parametrized on the state, and I set the state here. Um, and then I describe the fields that I have available. This is actually a map. As if you know Erlang Syntax, you will see that this is a map. And I have, using this valros, valros uh, I have defined which fields are um, like uh, mandatory. Um, I've also said that this is a binary, but it's an ESO auto section that's formatted binary. But if you look at down here, the name and email and stuff, they're all just new types, basically. They're all just synonyms. But it's good for documentation. And Dialyzer does not respect this, but another tool could actually enforce nominal typing here. Uh, Dialyzer only uses structural typing, so it will resolve all these until it gets to binary. So you can mix stuff. So you can write stuff that looks should have been violating the type system, but it doesn't because that's not how dialyzer actually functions at the lowest level. I defined all of the states as well as uh, all of these atoms. And atoms in the Erlang type system, the dialyzer type system are kind of special. Those are the closest thing is like the TypeScript string literal types. They are a type in and of itself. So like Dialyzer knows that the difference between incomplete and pending confirmation, it will not know the difference between different binaries or strings, but it will know the difference between these two. And we will come into play later because this, by parametrizing the type up here on state, that means that we can actually express state conditions at the type level, which means that you get a dialyzer error if you try to return the wrong state. Kind of cool. Um, New, just creates a default one. Some empty binaries. These are basically empty strings for everyone that does not know Erlang syntax. Yes, it looks weird. Yeah, I'm sorry. Use Elixir. Uh, you didn't hear that. <laughs> um, undefined, even though it has a special color here, it's just an atom. It's just um, like a convention that we use undefined to mean um, well, the opposite of a defined value. It's not null. Null is unit or bottom. 
but undefined is the like the 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 no no the no value you know no return um yeah some jQuery style um uh, accessors one parameter in you get it two parameters you set it no con inga konstigheter should like to say in swedish here it gets to be more exciting but i'm going to skip over on just for a tiny second because then we have the states so i'm modeling each state as a function of this module so that you do user colon incomplete user colon blah 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 right uh, and then all of them will take the same parameters in and usually you expect them to return the same stuff they won't which we'll look into later and you can see like oh but if you expect this then you will get a crash so um the idea here is that you you can call each of them in the same way and this is what on does on is basically a dispatch so you can call it with the user object with some sort of event and some data of that event and you dispatch the event just like uh advent listeners in javascript or your favorite language basically i'm doing here by hand right this is this is you know kind of quick and dirty but it works and uh, it also happens to be um, uh, tail call optimized so it doesn't even cost anything which is nice um looks at the state calls the same function i could have done this dynamically um like this but okay a can you read that if you can you are you are writing way too much Alang. please come join us uh if you don't, it's okay, because that looks bonkers. And also, every single tool is going to get real confused by this. So instead, I'm being explicit and, uh, you know, actually doing the work here. Yeah, it's copy-paste code. It's fine. This is better, because this means that all tools can follow much easier, which gets you better um, type information when you run a dialyzer. Speaking of which, Incomplete. It takes the type T in the state incomplete. It's going to be incomplete a couple of times there. But this is really clear, right? You can't call this function if the state is not incomplete. That would be an error. That's bad. Don't. Right? Uh, this means just that this A map, it can include anything else. It, like the empty. When you pattern match on a map, it doesn't mean it has to be the empty map. It just has to be a subset of the map. So you are allowed to have extra keys. It makes more sense if you actually map on, match on one or two keys and you can have more. Uh, for example, if you pattern match on state incomplete, but you can also have the name and email, right? But uh, the empty map, uh, you can match like this. This only tells you this is supposed to be of the type map. Classic uh, result type. Okay, or error tuples, tag, error, result, either, you know, chat, ban, har, mongan namn. In this case, I only accept the sign up event. If I were to have more events here, I would type them here to be able to tell to the dialyzer, hey, you can call me with these and these events. Again, atoms are special, they can actually get tracked. So that's nice. Uh, some reasons, again, you could have, if you have more reasons, you can do that. Which fields are we allowed to talk about? Stuff like that. Uh, this does some pattern matching to check if you are calling this with some sort of empty um, email or name, and or name, and then returns a map of with field and that they are missing if they are. And if everything is fine, call the, the setters change the state to pending confirmation everything is good okay we also said pending confirmation 
So if we run dialyzer right now, it's going to be good. It's going to say, oh yeah, everything is good. But if I try to return another state, say active here, and run dialyzer, dialyzer will be sad. Not it. Nej, din jävel! It used to be sad. Okay. Maybe if I do foo. What happens then? Uh, th this is why I love demos, by the way, because some, something breaks. <laughs> okay, this is hilarious. I apparently have been fooling Dialyzer too much. That's, that's funny. Uh, I did get this error message while I was coding this before. So I guess, I guess this code is now too complex, so it gets confused. Which is really sad, actually. Uh, but it's good. That means that you can't trust Dialyzer all the time. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> Same thing here, confirm email, active, blah, 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 grace period. Okay, yeah, so the grace period. Here we actually look at the offboard. We do some, we add some dates, we do some formatting, and then we check if now it's within the grace period. And here, instead of returning a user, we're returning an atom, which means that this last state returns another type. Okay? Could be good. Hopefully people not get too bored. Okay, let's talk about proper. So proper, you give it a, you say that you do this behavior, uh, you include this proper thing. It will import a bunch of functions. So if you see a function that I'm calling here that does not, that's not part of the or like the that I haven't defined here, it's probably because it's imported from proper. Uh, it imports for uh, functions for all types and stuff like that. So integer, map, list, that sort of stuff. Um, first, we have the city test stuff. You only need all. You can do the init per suite, init per test case stuff if you need to have setup and teardowns. They are run in a different process. So some stuff does not work the way you expect. For example, if you want to use mech, the mocking library, you can't use those inside uh, init per suite or init per test case uh, super easily. You have to do some, some stuff, extra stuff. This is the test. This is the common test that does run this, the property testing, right? This is the bridge between them. Then proper itself or proper state them that I'm using the, needs these callbacks. These are commands that we will talk about later, and these are symbolic calls, which we'll also talk about later. I don't have any custom types here, but if I were to have custom types, I could export them here. Um, if they need to be exported, that is. It, it uh, kind of depends. This is super simple. Like, this CT test only have one test to run, right? This test, so it's just all like that. Here we have something interesting. Proper quick check. Call this property, run 100 tests, give me, return a long result, and uh, find stuff. Quick check will actually run this test many, many, many times, right? But by the time the proper quick check call itself returns, either it will have found a um, counterexample or it will have passed, right? So inside here, it's going to run it like 100 times. But once it actually returns, so in this of here, now we're actually done, right? Uh, some uh, some um, translation between quick check and the outer world. If you you need to return fail like this for uh, for CT to be happy. And why do I do this instead of using CT's property testing bridge that's like built in? Because it does not respect options at all. It doesn't pass along options, which means that you can't change the num test or long result. Do it this way instead. Don't do what CT test thinks you should do because it does not work. This took some time to figure out. It ended up with my colleague calling uh, the guy who wrote property test, since he happens to know him. Costis is uh, really nice. Thank you, Costis. Anyway. Here's the actual property test. For all macro from the prop, uh, from proper, 
you're going to see this a lot. For all basically defines a property test in the proper world, like in proper world. Um, this is the property that we want to test. Uh, it basically gets matched on this, and then it runs this thing inside a function. So it looks a bit weird, but you could imagine it as if it were written like this. And then you run this begin thing. Uh, of course, since pop proper needs to run your test many, many, many times, not just once, it has to do some wrapping and uh, stuff to make it to work its magic. This is where property state and run commands. Again, run the commands in the context of this module. <laughs> when fail, another macro. If it fails, run the first one. If it works, run the second one. This basically does prints the stuff that happened and say, hey, if it failed, dump some stuff to the log so that they can take a look at it. This can be improved. Uh, agree command stuff result okay thing. Uh, this basically just uh, gives you now statistics at the end if it did work. You get like how many calls of the different like percentage, how many calls of the different versions of the different functions you were called. Uh, uh, we're gonna look at the output and you're gonna see what what I mean. Here we have initial state. This state looks a bit different. User, no user. But we also have the state outside. We have a current day and we also save the email. In this case, uh, the email one is not used anymore, I don't think, but it doesn't matter. Um, this is the state of the state machine, the testing state machine. And here you can keep a bunch of bookkeeping around, which allows you to test the actual thing, in this case, user, right? But you may want to keep stuff like current day, which is a way for me to track time so that I can fake advancing time. So I keep it outside. Uh, I was also doing a lot of experiments with email. Uh, that's why we have email. And I also want to keep this, the state as well on the outside so that I can look on the inside and the outside and verify between them. The big one, command. This is a callback that gets called repeatedly uh, with the model or the initial state here, usually called model. Um, you need to return a property, like a proper property, not an actual command. And this is where things gets real, gets real. Yeah, let's just say that. So that's why I use this one of, which is a function imported from proper which allows me to say, I want one of these. It's like a union, a choices type stuff. Uh, this one of actually returns a tuple with a bunch of information that the proper engine later on calls. It doesn't actually return one of these. It doesn't do a random call. It returns information about which random stuff it can do, right? And this is what I'm talking about. It actually returns a property that describes multiple different cases. And this is why you can also use this lovely let. Here I'm saying let days be an integer between 1 and 30 inside this expression. So here, inside this expression, days is actually a, a, a number, a real number, not a, one of those fancy prop types. Uh, but let returns a property again, and you can do this recursively, which means that when a proper resolves, like wants to actually get a value, it recursively resolves all of these properties, actually calls it with some sort of random seed, blah, 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 puts them all together, and you end up with uh, uh, one of these things that looks like this. This is a good more easy one to read. Call module confirm good email user. This is what's called a symbolic call. So command up here does not actually run a command. It returns 
one command that can be run given the current state of your testing module. <laughs> this gets really complicated really fast, but um, bear with me. The idea is that uh, proper actually generates many, many sequences of commands. And during shrinking, it actually like modifies the sequence that it has found that failed and starts generating new commands and branches off from that and stuff. And all of that needs to happen without side effects, right? You can't have side effects in here because this is called many, many, many times. Way more than 100, by the way. I'm running 100 tests. This gets called thousands of times to generate all those 100 tests, okay? The net result is that each of these calls is basically module colon confirm good email uh, with these parameters. That's what gets called at the end when it actually gets resolved, when it actually gets called, um, which is nice. I'm using a convention by placing an at symbol, which is legal in, uh, in Erlang variables, little known fact, to mark stuff that's symbolic. So user here is an actual user. But after a while during this command generation, user becomes a symbolic value, which is like var one, which makes no sense because it will get resolved when it runs the sequence. And that means you can't pattern match on user at all. It's an opaque value. That's just the thing. And this is where it gets complicated because you can't, the usual tool that we all love in functional programming, pattern matching, gets taken from you. God damn it! All right. So you have to do other stuff instead. Um, since I wanted to keep this a bit dry, I added an event, the dispatch event command, which also does some 1.0, which also does some lets with event property, and event property does some more let stuff with some sign up and blah, blah, blah. This is just. Like, I could have written all the inline inside command here, but it will be really, really big. Uh, the nut result is that it will call either this module's advanced day, confirm good email, confirm bad email, or user on, you know, the event dispatch function that we talked about, with one random event. So just push in events. It's fine. The events are depending on which state it's currently in. So we look at the state that the testing module is in to figure out which event we can send. And as long as they kept in sync, it's fine. If they're not, you're going to start calling this stuff with something else and everything breaks down. It's sad. We're going to look at what that looks like later by just commenting out this thing above. It's going to crash. Um, yes. Here I have an A property. Again, generate some test data. One of generate some test data. This is the, the easier ones. These are also useful if you want to write generative tests using proper. You can write stuff like that. I like this rather than just saying binary. A, because binary is bonkers, or if you even if you use UTF-8, okay, you get random text, that's fine. But the problem is you can't read that. This is much more readable. So I prefer that because that means that the test case that I'm looking at when I'm trying to debug him says John at example.com rather than, you know, some long string of Chinese characters and stuff. I'm not using precondition in this particular instance. I use pattern matching to make sure that I generate commands correctly from the beginning. But each command up there gets filtered through the precondition to make sure that it's actually valid. Since I always return true, it's fine, right? It's always going to be fine. You can do filtering here. If you do that, though, and you're too harsh, uh, proper will give up and say, hey, I couldn't find a valid command sequence because precondition was too sad. So, but if you, maybe you have a use case where it's much easier to express your constraints in a precondition instead, and that's fine. Here, we all, here everything is symbolic here. The model has symbolic stuff. Here's symbolic calls, etc. Post condition. Here is where we do the assertions, basically. Except we don't do an assertion. We actually just return true or false. Uh, but here we want to check the state. And in here, you get the, uh, the state as it was before. You ran this, this, uh, the function. The, the call that you actually ran 
and the actual results of that call, the real value. In post condition, there's no symbolic stuff anymore. You can, you can pat the match, it's all good. Everything is happy. Very nice. Uh, yes. So here I'm matching on what, again, what state I'm in. I'm matching on calls where, since I know that on has a user, an event, and some stuff, I can see, okay, when I'm in the state incomplete and I sent a sign up event with these parameters uh, and I got an error back, that is only valid if either name or email was empty. So you can express this here. Right. And then you have similar stuff for the different states. You have from friend and completion, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to come back to confirm email and confirm good email, confirm bad email. Oh, I can just mention it briefly. It's, it turned out to be really hard to generate random emails and figure out if they were valid or not, um, like using the let macros. So it's much easier to just define two functions where I define it as a good or a bad. And then I can pass the match here because this will always be like an atom. It's fine. Even in a symbolic call, it's always going to be an atom. Uh, and then I know it's supposed to be good. I know it's supposed to be bad. And that's why I can then check the tag here to make sure it's OK or error. This is much easier to, to make that happen. So this is like, OK, it would be nice if I just generated an email and checked if it was OK. But I can't do that because I'm in a symbolic world. And that means I need to be able to work with this symbolically. And this comes not here. But when we go to the next callback, which is called next state, where we also work with symbolic uh, values. Uh, when we advance the day, that's just an eternal function uh, to be able to advance the day, right? We don't, that's just part of the testing harness. It doesn't matter. We, we don't change the user. So we just return true. And then finally, uh, here we look at the result, where the result is ignore or delete, and then we check if the current day, if it is less than 30. And this is basically to say that unless 30 days has passed since after you have offboarded, you should uh, not delete this user. And then for everything else that I haven't defined, it's fine, right, true. If you want to add a, a condition, you continuously add on top of this. You add more function clauses here to be able to say more about a specific subset. Right? Next state. OK, so I said that uh, you were calling command repeatedly. You're actually calling command precondition and next state repeatedly because it calls command. Then it calls precondition to make sure that it actually is a valid command. And then it calls next state to produce the next state so that it can call command again with a new state, so on and so forth. And that's how it generates more and more calls, right? Great, except everything becomes symbolic now because everything is symbolic. God damn it. <laughs> oh, you know, potato, potato. Uh, so stuff that comes in here is the model again, as we all know. The symbolic call is number three here, as you recognize. And then we have this, this parameter here, which actually should be a matter because it's symbolic. Sometimes it's dynamic or symbolic. It turns out treating it as symbolic, it's fine and you don't need to care and never try to use it as an actual dynamic value. It's fine because otherwise you're gonna get a bunch of weirdness. So treat it as symbolic and it's fine, but it can be dynamic because it's also used after you, the actual call, it also calls it to get the real new state to be able to perform the next call. Um, stuff inside the call, since we use let, which generates an integer, generates an email, it means that inside the let, I said that it was a real, not a symbolic value, right? It means that this name and email at this point are actual real values, which means we can pat a match on them. We can look at them. We can do a when. And this means that I can say that I'm going to assume that after the call 
on sign up where the emails are not empty, I'm going to end up in the state pending confirmation. This is what that state says here. We actually set it. And then later on, we will verify this. Right? So this is how we like, we can look at, we take a peek inside the symbolic call to figure out our next state, what it should be in. And we could also have looked inside the models of the previous state to be able to understand this. And by the, model, the previous state, I mean the previous state of the testing module, F test state. Then they have this lovely helper function, symbolic update user from result. Yeah. Uh, there's a bunch of more stuff, this similar stuff. We're not going to talk about that too much. I'm just going to show you symbolic update from user of result. Result, again, is a symbolic value, which means that result is probably a var or something. It says nothing. So how do we do this? Well, if we return a symbolic call instead, at the time when result is not a symbolic value anymore, proper will call whatever we specify here with a real value. So what we do is we just say call module some, some function with the stuff. Lovely. And that's below. Here, it's an actual value. Every time you need to handle something, just use a symbolic trampoline like this. It's the easiest way. Here you can pat the match to your heart content. No problemo. Shh. Right? Um, and then we have a bunch of print commands, but that's, that's just for debugging. That's not super important. Uh, days from now here, it takes the days. It does some stuff. Again, days from now are also used in a symbolic call somewhere. So that's why we need them uh, separately as well. Um, yeah. So the model, I'm going to change the user field to this symbolic call is what happens here. So that's why models user is going to be turned into this call of call of call of R of call of R. It's going to look like this huge. But it's fine because it gets resolved at some point. Okay. Hooray! My test, test suite passed. Yay! I'm starting Firefox. Yes, I'm starting Firefox. Oi, I worry a little bit. Uh, okay, so in the HTML, you get the dots vertically <laughs> because, of course, you do. Uh, here's what it looks like when a test tube passes. You get to see how much percentage of time it's spent on the user on function, on the advanced day, confirm or confirm, good or bad email, like this. Of course, you might have more functions. Like, I'm abusing user on, right? That's why over half of this time is spent there. You can have weighted instead of a, just a union that I choose, like the one of. You can actually weight it instead. You can do sorts of tweaks. You can even do f uh, targeted and have a user function that you maximize and all sorts of stuff if you really want to do. But this is here you can see. Ran 100 tests, everything is good. Okay, let's try to break stuff and see what happens. So if we start to return false in you know, one of these uh, somewhere, every time you call false um, advanced day, you, you're going to get uh, a bad, uh, um, you get the failure here. Oh, latest test results. Failed after 20 tests. Then it failed. And this is a really long one, so you're not going to need to look at that. But you can look at the. So th this is what actually gets printed out by CT, and it's just horrifying. This is the stuff that got printed in the when failed, right? Here you have set var call user on, set var call user on, blah, blah, blah. And you can get this call user result from or module. You get this really deep stuff but you can you can read that you can see okay here the user call on user on confirm good email right okay and then user on again 
Set var advanced day, right? Okay, user on. You can you, so you, if if you squint your eyes, you can see some stuff. The history tells you what the state was and what the actual return value was from the different calls. The actual state is the last state that it was in, and then you have the actual uh, result from from the property quick check, which is in this case post condition false. However, then it did some shrinking. Shrink it five times, and you get this instead. Advanced day failed. Bam. In my case, I have made a function that makes it so it actually tries to print it out in Erlang syntax instead of this obnoxious stuff. Uh, so you can see that as well. OK. If you try to, as I said before, if you, if you Confirm good, bad email, for example. Remove that. I should get a failure. Bam! Again, go in here. Okay, failed after nine tests. And now you get an exception function clause pending confirmation. So you try to call pending confirmation. It probably try to use an event that's not valid in the pending confirmation state in this case. And it tried to do offboard, right? You can't offboard while in pending confirmation. That's not allowed. So. And then you again, like runs, and then you can actually try to shrink it. It didn't uh, find any better. Uh, here uh, again, you can write some code if you want to to do stuff like this to try to figure it out. Unfortunately, all binaries become this junk instead of, you know, email. This is probably maybe, maybe this is Jane at example.com. Kind of looks like. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> and it 97, that's A, right? I think. Oh, anyway, so. Stuff like this. This is how it looks like. Please use it. Questions? What? <laughs> Are you in shock or, or, or shock and or? <laughs> shock. <laughs> do, you have, do we have any questions from the audience online? One question to you, Max. Yes. Um, you said you're going to show how to, to teach the uh, product owners how to, to, uh, to use state machines and how you can teach them. So elaborate on that. Because if I show a product owner this, they, they, it's no, not uh, <laughs> that they're going <laughs> to. When, when we introduced the concept of state machines, or when I introduced the concept to my product owner, I said, I basically did a lifetime argument, right? You have a user, or in our case, a company. It's uh, uh, signing on, it's there, then it's trying to offboard. We have a, a period of four to five days at Kiva where you can change your mind, where you have time to download all your content, blah, 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 before we wipe everything. We have that grace period and stuff. So it's kind of easy. And what I said is like, please define the states that you believe our product is in. Like describe mm. the life cycle and draw lines. And you can do that on paper or you can do that in Google Drawing or whatever. And mm -hmm. I did it, they did it mostly on the whiteboard. And then they did some Google Drawing, I think. And from that, you could derive down to what you're going to code or implement. Uh, yeah, so like once they've done that, me and uh, my colleague, we were then talking with them and be like, OK, but here is what what does this mean okay but do we need this arrow here okay what does this mean and then he figured out that we needed another state that we didn't even have hmm? and so it's like draw on the draw just drawings and then right okay when i show stuff like this to my product owner he's just going to be like wow <laughs> <laughs> when i show this to my colleagues most of us are going to be like oh <laughs> so it's okay uh but drawing, like actually draw and lines 
and specify the events, the business mm. event, the domain events that says that this and this happens. Super useful. Of course, at work, I have written an uh, engine that uses behaviors and modules uh, that's also integrated with our uh, uh, database layer. And, uh, like, and you can run, it uses a fixed point instead of this manual recursion. So you return the next event and it like continuously run the event machine uh, until it arrives at a steady state and then it aborts. It also has logic to detect recursion and has logic to de detect if you uh, yeah, have infinite recursion due to other problems. So it's like a bunch of, X and then it has a bunch of logging and like instrumentations. So like the actual implementation of the state machine engine that I've written is way more complicated than this. But this is also fine, right? One thing that I didn't really touch upon here is that this is pure. All of the stuff that I did was pure. I just changed data. Something would have pulled it up from the database, and then you could put it down. As long as the stuff here in the middle is pure, or you return a list of side effects, aka send this email, so that you can run the state machine without actually doing a side effect, you're golden. Mm -hmm. Without that, you can't do shrinking. Because if the shrinking like backs up and replays and does a bunch of stuff, right? So that could be really uh, spend on there. <laughs> <laughs> Exciting. <laughs> Exciting. Yeah, so, so, and we have a lot of, uh, in order to know which state we're going to, we have to do some API calls, external APIs, which means that uh, we do not do any shrinking on our property based in our proper tests. Uh, we can't do that because of... I have uh, one question. Yes. Does next state get called twice? Two times? Uh, hundreds of times. Hundreds of times, yes. Thousands. As many times as command. Hmm? And not twice as many as command. One per symbolic call and one uh, like during command generation and one per dynamic call between each evaluation of the calls. Cool. Yes. Thank you very much, Max. Thank you very much. Yeah. Ah, just there. You glimmed the watch. Here's the questions. Yes. You passed the questions. Yes. Absolutely.